Uh, this is part two. I'm here with professional player Jason Grinovich. And uh, so we're talking about coaches on this segment also because uh, I think we got a lot to cover, Jason. What do you say? Oh, absolutely. We've all played for a, a ton of coaches in our life. Yeah. Uh, one of them I recall in the USHL when I played, um, one thing he would do every day was called Coach's Treat. And basically we'd do a shootout. So the winners would go on one side and the losers would go on the other side. And then the winners would play for an orange. So they'd keep playing until they had a you know, last man standing. And then you, the losers would play for Coach's Treat. Could have been like Pickles Pig Feet or... Uh, artichoke hearts or a raw onion he, so the player had to eat whatever the coach brought the whole thing he couldn't get out of it <laughs> That's funny. so that was one thing i remember in the ushl and uh just it was a first year coach and i remember having in my career two coaches first year and to think back i prefer not to play for a first year coach like rookie coaches just because they just don't have the experience uh at that level and uh they they, they we missed a lot because uh you know playing at uh for uncle ned and other great coaches then you go up and you see these guys like oh no it's not as good uh how yeah, about you, Jason? It, yeah it's definitely that way with with guys that are new in the new to the coaching world yeah. especially at higher levels it uh it definitely takes them a, a, a little bit of time to adjust in, in strategy and, and approach so it, it's definitely a lot harder to play for a, for a coach like that don't get me wrong there yeah. probably are some great ones that step in and do a bang up job but yeah. there's uh there's a lot that not so much um you yeah. know i know in, in in junior uh you know i was i was playing locally here and, and we had a coach there and everything was fine and dandy and then he left and we got a, a newer coach and uh you know he was just uh he, he was a he was a weird dude like he you know he played a lot of mind games with you and you know it just you know him and i like i said before it was it was one of those unfortunate circumstances that uh you know him and I just didn't see eye to eye. He didn't appreciate what I brought to the table. And, and you know, he definitely wasn't going to set me up for for success. No. So, uh, you know, I, I had to leave that. I mean, the no. only unfortunate circumstance was, uh, you know, uh, not getting to see his wife around the ring because she was, uh, she was, she was <laughs> a 10 out of 10, I'll tell you that right now. <laughs> I, I saw her, him and her in the summertime when I was there in Bonneville, I believe. I can't mention the team, but... Anyways, I rem was it true that players wanted to go to the hospital? They were pretending they were injured so they can see her. Is that a true story? I mean, oh yeah, because nobody, nobody really liked, nobody really liked the coach. Like he uh -huh. was, uh, you know, everybody hated him. But his his wife was a smoke show and she was a nurse, so they would any injury be like, oh, I, I gotta go to the hospital, right? <laughs> so just sucking it up, yeah. <laughs> like a paper cut or just a little like stuff. Even how a meatball like that landed something, something like her is beyond me. <laughs> What about uh, one story you told me where someone drew eyes on the board, they were showing some play in practice, and the guy just came out of the hospital, and he, he was like, I guess unconscious or something, but when he opened his eyes, he saw this beautiful nurse looking over him. Is that is that true story? Remember you were telling me about that a while back? Yeah, that was, yeah, that was, <laughs> that was, that was, that was blue. He got, uh. Uh, he got knocked out, and, and I don't remember whether it was a hit or a fight or something like that. And, yeah, when he came to, she was staring at him. And, yeah, he's like, man, I was, I was looking. And he didn't know, like, he didn't know that that was Coxie's wife. So he oh. was he was telling the story, and, and, yeah, it was it was it was his wife. So it was it was kind of funny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's crazy. Uh, a lot of crazy coaches and a lot of good ones. So I had a good one in Sweden out of the years I played uh, pro hockey. Uh, yeah. There are uh, one coach, and he's been in the NHL now, involved for over 30 years, and he was very good as far as technical plays. Uh, I learned a lot from him, and uh, just a genius. Uh, the other coaches I had, they were not bad. They weren't the greatest, but they were... The scene in Sweden is more like... Uh, they don't do a lot of punishment like they do in North America. It's more just strategy, and it's a quick, high-tempo practice, and then you're done. Usually it's like a 50-minute practice, 5-0, and that's it. That's yeah. whole, that's for the day. It's very different than North America, but uh, strategy-wise, they were very smart overall, you know. Well, the, the Europeans, the actual Europeans in, in their game are, are, 
you know, quite a bit more advanced in their development and, and, and from, a, from a coaching standpoint to a skill set standpoint. And, uh, you know, they, they have been for quite a few years. And, and you know, in North America now, we're, we're, we're studying their game. Uh, and finding out, you know, we, we send coaches over and teams over all the time to study, you know, what what they're doing. Finland is one right now that they're really targeting, uh, as well as Sweden. Obviously, Sweden, we follow Sweden, you know, forever. So yeah. it's, uh, it's it's good to see that we're, we're recognizing the European countries and coaches and their approach to the game and, and how much more skilled those players are are, are in, the, in, in the elite levels. Yes. Uh, yeah, so in Europe, I mean, it's uh, you see the rink's bigger and... Uh... You just have to make the adjustments and the coaches, uh, like I've seen, uh, from what I heard and uh, seen, you have, say, 50 teams, 50 different strategies. Compared to North America and NHL, pretty much they do all the same thing. The breakouts are similar, but in Europe, it's very different. Every team is different. Uh, stuff I've seen now in the NHL, we did that like 25 years ago, Those the same kind of breakout play. So they're coming with it now to the NHL, which is... <laughs> A quarter of a century later, <laughs> completely yeah, different. Yeah, and, and it's it's because the game is as it, well, yeah. one that the yeah. players are so much more skilled. But you know, it used to be a, a dump and chase, rough, tough, you know, game. Yeah. And and you know now it's very much a, a puck possession game. Like you look at uh, the Colorado Avalanche, man, it's a rarity that you see those guys dump that puck in. They yeah. they turn it the blue line and pass it back and take another approach and it's it's kind of cool to see and and, yeah. and 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 watch that uh, the game evolve. I guess you'd say. Yes. Uh, so, any other coaches that we can think of? Well, we kind of know where we're going. We're headed here, and uh, I know where you're headed, yeah. and I know where I'm headed. We shared the same coach in different leagues that we played. I would have to say yeah. this is the worst uh, human being coach that I had. I don't know if I should mention his name or not, but uh, you can start with your story if you like, or I can start with mine. And I know where we're yeah. headed with this one. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I know the coach. Uh, I had him. He was, uh, you know, again, one of those coaches where he, you know, he picked his, his one or two guys. Oh, you, you broke up. Boys, and unfortunately, uh, you uh, broke up. Jason. My, I, uh, yeah, you broke oh, up. Oh, sorry, sorry. I, I said, uh, yeah, this coach, he, he, I didn't enjoy him whatsoever, and, and he didn't enjoy me. Uh, you know, just personality wise, we didn't, uh, we didn't mesh too well. Yeah. Uh, but he, uh, you know, he, he picked his one or two golden boys and, and the rest were his whipping horses. And unfortunately I was the rented mule that he beat the wheels off of. And I remember uh, we were going through, uh, you know, just kind of preseason and, and we called it ROTC training. Yes. Uh, where basically he would kick the wheels off you know, off the ice and on the ice. And, and, you know, that was his strategy, I guess, to break yeah. everybody. And so we, we went all day and, and, you know, he sent us back home to grab a quick bite to eat and then called us back to the rink and, so I got to the rink and, you know, I think it was at seven o'clock. We we're supposed to be there. I got there at six forty-five and, you know, waited it around and nobody's there. Nobody's there. Nobody's there. Yeah. And I'm like, well, what the heck? Where is everybody? And well, they had left, you know, at six thirty instead of seven o'clock when we we're supposed to be there. So I ended up on what we called breakfast club. Uh huh. Well, breakfast club was six o'clock in the morning and he beat you. It was you and him. And I'm telling you, from the gym to, I mean, you played this guy. It was like a racket. Uh -huh. and really good you play racquetball and you know then it was always you were set up to lose and i remember my last day i can't swim i mean that's something about me that uh some people know some people don't yeah. but I, I i sink i'm a rock in the water i i can't i can't doggy paddle i can't tread water i i just it's not my thing i, I yeah. can't do it so but, and he knew this and on the last day he said okay bring your swimming trunks uh and, and we're gonna go to the pool and swim and i'm like this is stupid right he knows i can't yeah. swim and so anyway he gave me a kickboard and, and enough, i would say just laugh oh, you broke up skateboard. again there you know? oh sorry <laughs> sorry said, it's a bad uh, connection that's all right that'll happen and yeah, uh, yeah. so anyway so i i, I back and forth for like an hour and a half and then he said uh he said okay now you got to tread water and yes. you know i'm like catch you know so you, you know i have to tread water for 30 seconds Yes. And obviously I can't swim, so I mean, I can't tread water for four seconds, let alone anything, so I would just sink and <laughs> scratch my way up the wall and, and, you know, get, you know, get to the surface and climb out, and so yes. he grabbed five pound weights, and I thought, I thought, okay, well, that's kind of cool, he's going to jump in and carry his weights to say, like, hey, if I can do this with five pounds, yes. you know, holding, well, five pound weights in each hand, so ten pounds, you know, you can figure it out and suck it up and, and, and be done. And he said, you know, if you want to be done and Breakfast Club is done and we put this in the past, you got to figure this out. But the weights weren't for him. The weights were for me. Oh. 
So, so I held these weights. I jumped in the water. I tried. I come up. I, you know, I did this for probably I don't know another forty five minutes with the lifeguard standing there, looking at him like he's crazy, and, and he yeah. was. So I remember I was like, you know what? Screw it. Like I got nothing left in me. I'm just. I, I told him I said, don't come get me until the time's up. Yeah. And I, I, I jumped in the water, held the weights right to the bottom of the deep end, and I just stood there looking up. And you know what? I swear he he had me under there for at least a minute before oh, he tapped us. And I just dropped the weights, shot right up to the top of the pool, scratching the wall to get to the top, and just right to the bathroom and puked everywhere. And oh. You know what he did? All he did when I was sitting there puking uh, was he gave me a boot in the ass and said, you know what? I thought you were going to quit. I just turned around and walked out. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah, he, he, uh, was, a, he was a terrible individual. I got to ask you this. The harder you worked in practice, is that the more you got punishments off the ice? Because that's how I felt. Uh, I don't know. So before I start my story, wanted to ask you, did if you worked really hard, was he punishing you more? Like for... <laughs> Just doing yeah, good. Yeah, it, it, it was. I mean, he, uh, okay. like I said, I wasn't his favorite player, and and you know his dad really liked me, and and so I remember we played. Uh, I think we were playing Nebraska Omaha, uh, uh-huh. you know, at home, and we played on Friday night. It was Fridays and Saturdays, uh, yes. so we played on Friday night, and we lost the game, and so you know Saturday he calls me in. Uh, we have our, our morning meeting, and, and he says, "Hey, can you stick around?" And so I, I, I said, yeah, sure. So I stuck around. He said, you're going to play on the top line tonight. And I said, oh, that's awesome. I'm excited for that. And he said, my dad said if, uh, cause he was there and, and he said, if I would have played you last night, uh, we would have won that game. Mm-hmm. And so he said, I'll prove him wrong. And so we played that game and we ended up winning the game, I think like four to one, five yeah. to two, someplace in like that. Yeah. And, you know, I had two goals, two assists and first star and, and won the game. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. so we're leaving the pump post, which Saturday nights, we always had like a fan, a fan event. Yeah. And I was leaving the pump post, and he saw me leave, and he walks outside, and he looks at me, and he's like, hey. And all he says to me is, uh, you know what? Fuck you. You just proved him right again. Oh, not a good terrible. game, not a nothing. And, and you know what? The next weekend, I was back on the fourth line, zero minutes, like nothing. Like, it was, yeah. it was just a bad, bad individual. Bad I, I didn't dude. enjoy playing for him yeah. whatsoever. I, You know, that was a coach that, you know, he comes to mind that, you know, he doesn't believe in you, and yeah. if your coach doesn't believe in you and, and what you bring to the table, you're not going to be successful. No, no matter how much you try. I remember, uh, you know, I had a great practice one time. I was flying out there, working my ass off, and just really well. I was very happy with what I did, and he's like, uh, Jack, come here. This was in the minors. And he's like, uh, Jack, I want to see you in the office, please? I said, okay. And he's like, uh, let's go somewhere. I'm going to show you. So we're, our practice rink is maybe about a half hour drive from the main stadium and it's in a rough neighborhood. So the main stadium is not in the best part of town. And back then we didn't have any yeah. cell phones. So I left my wallet and keys at the in the locker room, dressing room and practice facility, figuring I'm going to come back in like five, ten minutes. He drives me to the main stadium and he comes out. He's like... I want you to take a screwdriver. Here, he gave me a screwdriver, a flathead. He's like, I want you to peel all the advertisements off the boards. He left me there and just went. And uh, I didn't have any ride back. And I didn't do it. Obviously, I'm not going to do any of that. It doesn't say in my contract that I'm supposed to be doing any kind of labor work besides playing yeah. hockey. So um, I asked one of the usher. I had to find someone to drive me back. And I didn't even know the roads like how to get back so luckily <laughs> i found they dropped me off i found my way back and uh it was a bad experience not telling me what i'm gonna be doing or you know just surprising me when i got to the main stadium just because i worked really hard in practice and uh you know I, was, I don't know why so if you skate too hard or you do really well and he's like you always work too hard he's like you need to go out and party with the boys and stuff he he never encouraged me to like he's the opposite. If I work too hard, he was not happy about it, and it's kind of strange. So that's the one no, he experience. Was, he's he's one of those coaches. I always I always felt it was a power trip for him, and yeah. he had to let you know that he was in control. Yeah, he was the boss. He dictated your ice time. He, you know, it, well, you didn't earn anything. He gave it to you. 
when he chose, right? It was <laughs> just a, like I said, it's it's for for kids out there and 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 hockey players, regardless of your age. Do you know before you sign a contract and before you you know go to where you're going to go, do a good job of vetting the coaches and, and asking around about what their personality is and and you know whether you're going to mesh with them. Uh, because like I said, if if they don't like you. You're not going to be successful. You're going to be grumpy, uh, yeah. and they're in control of your future. They're in control of your ice time and your exposure, and you know it's it's terrible. Yeah, we didn't have any uh, off ice uh, training or anything like that. But uh, one thing that sticks in mind is the contract that I signed was about three hundred fifty a week, and I was getting only two seventy five. And I I went up to him and I said, "How come I'm only making two seventy five when I signed for you know three fifty? He said, uh, "Shut up and play," and that was it. So I don't know who was taking part of my paycheck, and I wouldn't doubt if it was him or it could be him. I'm not not blaming anybody, but I just felt like uh, I was short, you know, short changed there. Well, but again, anyway. that's the that's that's the little mind games that a coach like that plays with you, yeah. and. You know, if, if you, you know, it's just, it's unfortunate. That's the, that's the way yeah. the game goes. And I mean, you know, we're listing off, you know, some, some bad coaches and that, and, you know, some obviously I've talked about some <laughs> in good this ones. Segment, segment, right? and, in this segment, right? In this segment, right? Yeah, you right? know, it, they're, they're not all, not all coaches are bad. Right? No, and, no, and, no. And, you know, but they're just, you know, through, through the course of playing for a lot of years, you, you know, like you, you end up with some good ones. And, and, you know, unfortunately, I don't know of a player in, in the history of hockey that has played a career and, has always ended up with a great coach, you know. No, I've never heard of that. All the years I've been teaching kids, I haven't heard of anybody who's had perfect, perfect coaches all through their career. Definitely not. Uh, in California, I had a good and a bad. So in Bantams, I had a Canadian coach. He played in the old Western Hockey League, and he pre pretty much gave me the green light to play the way I want, and it was very helpful for me. Uh, but then they moved me out of that league because... Uh, They didn't allow me to play in that league anymore, <laughs> so I had to move up. <laughs> One goalie got his mask dented as he dropped, and he flew in the net. And then all of a sudden, they're like, "You can't play in the league, so you got to move up." So I went up to the midget league at 14, and uh, our coach, I remember, was uh, not as good as the one in the Bantams. Uh, he was drinking a six pack of beer. He used to sit on top of the boards and opening up the cold one. And you know, yeah. we're looking around like, "What should we do?" He's like. I said to the let's let's scrimmage, you know, let's play and stuff. So we did our own stuff. He'd be yelling and stuff, but he's just sitting there. We just ignored him. <laughs> and once in a while, That's he'd funny. run to practice, but not too often. And uh, it was funny because he's just sitting there and yelling, and he's got a six pack, and he's sitting on top of the boards like where the players' bench is, and he's just sitting there. And yeah. that's, that's one I recall. <laughs> that's pretty much all I got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's funny. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I do think Maybe, uh, my coach Don in Bantams, he was really good. Yeah, that's that's good. It's it's nice to hear that there are some good coaches yes. out there. And most of them, most of the good coaches have good hearts on them. Yeah, and, and they're in it for the right reasons, and and not really when they care about their players and the and the well being. It really, it, I, I find it just it goes a long way with the players, and they they seem to get the most out of those players. That's true. I mean, we talk about Ned, and he was very tough and all that, but we still respected him. We liked him because he did a good job for us compared to the other guy, you know, that I had in the minors, you had in college. He was just not, he was just not there for you when you needed that to build up your techniques or whatever, you know, the game, to improve you in the game. He was just not there for, for me. He wasn't there. Yeah, and that's that's exactly it. And, you know, like like you mentioned Uncle Ned again, and and you know he was one of those guys that when you executed, when you did, and 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 performed for him, he yeah. let you know that you performed, and he recognized that, and he yeah. appreciated that. Of But course. that was the the respect that that uh, he gave you, and it, it it showed that he cared about you, and and he he gave you the pat on the back when you needed the pat on the back. Yeah. But he gave you the the boot in the ass when you needed that as well. So I mean, it was yeah. a, a great relationship going forward with with from both sides. I would say. Yeah. Uh, you know, the nice thing about Ned was years later when I re retired, you know, I'm out of hockey. It was, I think, I would say midnight. I was still playing. Um, he came out to California to take his family to Disneyland. And it was he was only here for, I think, two or three days. But he made the effort to drive up an hour and a half from Anaheim. And he came to my house like at three in the morning. So here we are at three in the morning. <laughs> talking hockey and you know it's been like maybe 
I'd say like maybe five, six years since I've seen him and he came to over to my house. It was kind of nice for him to do at that time of the night and not being with the family, just taking the time to drive up. And that meant a lot to me that he did that. Yeah, and, and, and you know what, again, that's just a testimony to, to his character that yeah. even though you weren't playing for him or, or even playing the game of hockey anymore, he wanted to check in with his players and, and make sure you were doing okay, right? Yes. And, and see how yes. successful you were, right? And that was just, uh, uh, he's just a good person, right? And that's, uh, Pretty much. like I said, that's good Good coaches follow up with their players regardless of whether they're playing for them or it's 10 years later. Yes, it's true. Yeah, any I don't. This is the only coaches I. I mean, I've had other ones, you know, but uh, not good or not bad, and nothing to complain about or talk about. Except that's the only ones that I mean that mem that I have memories of, like good and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember we had I had one in uh, in uh, overseas, uh -huh. and it just kind of surprised me because he he was he was a North American guy, but he was a goalie, so I mean oh. that probably explains it, but. Uh, <laughs> He was trying to uh, he was trying to tell us that on the on a five on three that we shouldn't be taking one timers and shooting the puck from the top. What? <laughs> yeah, I'm telling oh, you. Man. So so anyway, so we, you know we all us imports we were kind of sitting down with him being like you're crazy like what you want us to do doesn't work because he was he no. was always complaining that our power play was no good and we were running what he wanted to and so finally he got frustrated and he said fine. Today's game, you guys do whatever the heck you want, <laughs> and so we so we ran in our way, and uh, you know we won the game. I think it was like eight four or something like that, and we wow. had six power play goals, and we hadn't wow. scored a power play goal in like five games running his way, and so he was <laughs> he was kind of crazy, like and then yeah, it was just crazy, just a, a little bit of a lack of understanding of of what that looks like. Yeah, well, one one story you told me there was a coach that bet you two hundred bucks you couldn't go top glove, and then you did it. And can you tell the story? What do you remember that one? Yeah, it was. Uh, yeah, that was that was overseas as well. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, it was then, overseas. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and I had, I had a yeah I had a great one. One of those guys was really great coach. My first year, uh -huh. uh, and and a great guy and funny guy and. So uh, the goaltender we were playing against was he was pretty amazing and and I'm not gonna lie I probably scored 90 percent of the goals that I've scored in my career at top glove that's just that's my go to that's my spot and so uh, I uh, the, and the, the goalie knew it like I mean we, we were going in and, and he knew that it, where I shot and so I, I had a penalty shot and, and coach was like I'll give you 200 bucks if you can go top glove <laughs> and so sure as shit I, I I buried it and he was just laughing and he's like there's no way I would have thought you'd ever hit that I'm like oh, it's always there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, was there a double or nothing, or was that that not in the book? Do you... No, he no, never, that, he, never no, he never bet me. He never bet me again. It was, uh, <laughs> yeah, that was that was a funny thing. We always had some sort of competition on the go, and, and you know, we did uh, similar the breakaway competition. We called it Juice Boy. And, oh. But it was when you scored, you were out, so you were yeah. done. You you won, right? And the last the last guy to score was the juice boy. Uh -huh. So and the coaches had to play in this too. Like it wasn't just the players. Yeah. And so I and so they like there was times where the coaches would lose, and so they would have to come in and, and go to the Gatorade and get everybody a cup uh -huh. and fill a cup and deliver it to your stall. Your so we called oh, it the juice wow. boy. So oh nice. It was pretty funny. Yeah. So it was it was just a comical. <laughs> Yeah. Comical little game that we played, uh, you know, a couple times a week. That was pretty ah, funny. funny. It's fun. Eases the tension, you know, gets the guys more tight knit. And if a coach is a genius that can do that, uh, that's a, that's the difference, you know. Then dividing. I see a lot of coaches that are dividing the kids or dividing the players. They pick their favorites, and then you got coaches that bring everybody together. It's just a talent on their part, I believe. Oh yeah, that's a that's definitely a, a key to success as a coach is to make sure that whether you're your top end guy or your bottom end guy, they still feel loved in there. Yeah. You know, if you seg if you segregate them, it segregates the locker room and kind of creates a hierarchy. And I mean, everybody knows if you're a fourth line grinder, you know you're not at the same level as as the the Connor McDavid, and and you yeah. know uh, everybody's treated. Uh, fairly not necessarily equally right so yes. your expectations and, and a Connor mcdavid can cough two pucks up and and he's still going to get his minutes where the fourth line guy you know he coughs it up once tries something silly i told you i get a blue line well that's not quite in your toolbox so you shouldn't be doing that and he's yeah. probably going to sit some minutes and everybody understands that so it is the coach's job yes. if he is a good coach to make sure that those players still stay united yes true yeah it's uh just interesting uh the hockey world, how it works, but uh, you know the experiences we got out of it. I think uh, it's a life lesson too. 
what what to do and what not to do kind of if you know yep. you know in general or in coaching or whatever it is in life you know I definitely agree with that it's yeah. uh, sports sports teaches life lessons I agree totally agree because the the odds and percentage of actually making it to the big leagues and, and having a career where when you're when you're done you retire and you're not worried about money or job uh, is I mean you got better odds of winning the lottery than you do of, of that happening so yes. you know what we yes. really need to take away as as coaches and as parents especially is that yes you think little Johnny is is the next one but <laughs> chances are he's not you know so just just learn that he's what he's getting out of that is more of a life lesson to become a, a good employee, a good business owner, a good friend, a good teammate, uh, and overall just a good person in life. That yes. should be the greatest takeaway from, from hockey and sport that any person can have. Yes, totally agree. Thank you, Jason. We'll talk to you soon. Hey, no, have a great No problem, one. Jacko. Thank Thanks, you. you too. Thanks.